Pico, that's not, this is a set of characters. I want to put her in front of. I wanted to put her in relationship to these young people who are present generation and who have died as a result of police brutality or other kinds of vigilante brutality because they are the sons and daughters that descend from Maddie. Yes, they are. And everything in her <coughs> that gave her worth and that preserved her with enough spunk to want to flee that circumstance and go somewhere else, that legacy of wanting to better oneself and to bring family along, it's often distorted in the world of now, but it isn't gone from the world of now. Every one of these young people has a connection to family. Mm -hmm. And their disappearance is experienced as loss. And unless we keep the frame of humanity around their presence, we underestimate the lingering damage in the post-slavery, post-colonial world that we're still looking at. You know, the 20th century, uh, true it was 100 years, but we were already two-thirds the way through the 20th century before the grossest aspects of 20th century racism and Jim Crow even starting to be recognized in law. Right. So when you think about the <clears throat> aftermath of all of that, it really is what we're looking at mm -hmm. in our daily experience. When you talk about the inequity and disproportion of poverty and health outcomes, we're looking at the our education, we're looking at the aftermath of those experiences. You want to say something, and I shouldn't monopolize. Well, what I, what I wanted to say, um, I wanted to say something about why have these conversations about work like Larry's and the issues that it raises. And um, I, I think we're at a point in time in the 21st century where Americans, like it or not, are being forced to look at the legacy uh, of slavery and the consequences of racism. And I also want to say that in some ways the conversations have been more and more difficult to have. And one of the experiences that Barry and I share, I, I grew up a, a pretty privileged little white girl in California, okay? And Barry in South Carolina, right? Yes. Um, but both of us were incredible. But not pretty privileged. Not pretty privileged. <laughs> <laughs> not pretty, and not white, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but um, we both had our lives, our young lives, changed by the murder of Emmett Till. Mm. Um, and that murder, um, I was 14 or 15, you were younger. Yeah, I was younger than uh, I was. Barry was elaborate. understandably terrified yeah. by that. Yeah. I didn't quite know what was happening, but if you have the experience of watching your Scottish grandmother, who was my father's mother, mm -hmm. and my mother, who was from the Middle West, both crying over the pictures in Jet Magazine because of what that mother of Emmett Till did by bringing her son <coughs> from to Chicago and saying, I want the world to see what they done to my son. I, as a young, privileged white girl, got to see the impact of one black woman and one child's death on the world. And I became involved in the civil rights movement at that point in time. Being part of the civil rights movement then, um, was a really ennobling experience. I mean, it changed my life, it changed the trajectory of my life, it, uh, and a lot of other lives. But I, I, I miss that interaction now. 
because as these, the forces, the ugliness of racism comes flaring at us in terms of these consequences, those conversations have become harder and harder to have. And one of the things Barry and I agree to is that having these conversations is important, mm -hmm. and art is a powerful way of capitalizing on those conversations. Justice. So um, that's what I wanted to say. But I believe that.